Okay, let me just check because sometimes it takes some time until people come in and I will give them a couple of seconds more and then we start. This is always with a virtual meeting. It takes some time until the audience is in place. Just one more minute. Okay. Okay. So it looks like as we are complete for now. Hello and good evening. Uh, welcome to our tonight's webinar. Uh, my name is Viola van Kremen. I'm a member of the European Parliament for the Greens EFA group. And I'm uh, very honored uh, tonight to have three distinguished speakers for our Syria Where Do We Stand uh, webinar. Uh, before I introduce my speakers and our guests for tonight, I would rather like to make a couple of quick technical remarks. So this is, of course, an interactive uh, event, and we would like to invite you to participate. So you can write in the Q&A uh, section, which you probably find, or you can also raise your hand and we give you the microphone. You can um, raise an oral question, or you're welcome to make any kinds of comments and remarks and questions, put them in the chat if you would like and prefer this. Uh, we record this event, uh, so in case you don't want to be called by name, please let us know also in the chat, uh, and uh, we do not want to uh, put any pressure on you. You can, whatever, um, uh, uh, I, we can just anonymously uh, uh, pick you uh, without naming you. So I'm very honored and I'm very glad that all of our speakers have agreed uh, to join this webinar or this digital event tonight. First of all, there's Ben Scheller. She's the head of the department of the Heinrich Böll Stiftung in Berlin. And she's the head of the Mid East and North Africa section. And uh, even better, she has spent seven years in the region where she was based in, in Beirut and the head of the office of uh, um, Mideast and of, of, of Beirut. And of course, she is very close and linked uh, to the situation uh, in Syria. Uh, second, uh, we are very honored to have uh, Muhammad Farish uh, with us tonight. Uh, he is from the region. He is originally from Syria, from Damascus, has left the country in 2012, as he has just told us, and is now located in the south of Sweden. But nevertheless, he has still family in the country, and he is uh, very capable to tell a lot of what's happening on the ground and how is the perspective from the people who, are still, who still live in Syria. And then there is the, let's say, initiator of uh, this tonight's event, uh, Lino Klevesat. He's a researcher from the University of Göttingen. And actually, he was the one who commented on Facebook recently when the um, Nobel Prize was awarded to the World Food Program. And he was kind of questioning whether this would be a good idea to give it to one of the UN organizations which actually supported mainly also the Assad uh, uh, regime for a long time. And it was never really a, a bigger issue, let's say, in, within the international uh, donors community. And I was very glad to read this. And I thought this could be a, a good, uh, let's say, time and a good, um, um, yeah, uh, and good um, issue and a good point to pick up on Syria while we have so many crises and so many conflicts and so many wars going on that actually Syria is kind of uh, uh, under the carpet, unfortunately. And I wish we could at least start tonight to enlighten um, our audience and our uh, interested uh, people and explain a little bit more in detail 
how is the situation now and what do people expect from us and why is it so difficult with all the international um, actors being involved in this region, especially in, in Syria for the last um, 10 years. So Syria, we, I think, uh, faced around 500,000 casualties. We have seen more than 11 million refugees, six and a half million, I think, stayed in Syria, but more than uh, five million have left the countries. So the destruction of, of, of the country is enormous, but nevertheless, there should be a future. So Bente, from, from your perspective, from your work on the ground, from the Heinrich Bell Foundation, what is your, I mean, what's your take on this and how would you see the, the current situation in, in Syria? Thank you very much for inviting tonight. I think it is really great that even though we have the US elections as strong competition, so to say, and even though, as you said, sadly, Syria has taken the back seat in reporting and attention, we really should focus on it because that we are not looking at it does not mean that the situation is not still developing. I think we have, in some regards, a situation that we are all familiar with. It's a situation in which large parts of the country are controlled by Assad. He has retaken areas, but we also have one area, a big area that is all east of Euphrates that is not really under his control. It is mainly Kurdish dominated forces that are controlling that part. And we have Idlib province, a small province, so to say, in the northwest, where obviously there are rebels in control, mainly HTS, a more extremist group. But what we are often focusing on more, there are three, two to three million people living, civilians mainly, people who didn't choose to be there. Half of the people who are living in Idlib are refugees from other parts of the country. And while the humanitarian and socioeconomic situation overall in Syria has been deteriorating constantly and life has become expensive life has become really a, a challenge in many regards for I think pretty much everybody unless they belong to the very tiny elite with the regime. For people in Idlib I think it might be the worst because this strip of land is not made for hosting that many people. You don't have infrastructure, you're not really connected to any friendly area, everything that comes in is controlled by Turkey mainly. And if you looked at the UN resolutions, we talked or you touched upon the World Food Programme. If we have an area with so many refugees, uh, like internally displaced people, so to say, living here, that means needs are big and they are largely dependent on aid deliveries. But UN resolutions have... Um, yeah, they have become so little. They have offered so little. There is just one border crossing through which aid can be delivered by the UN into Idlib. Uh, before it was two, that was already too little. Now, since July, we have just one border crossing through which the UN can bring aid into Idlib. And this is only for another nine months. It is to be suspected that after that, even this tiny possibility will be curbed. So. While the conflict in terms of military action might seem as if it has been decided, as the fate of civilians has not been decided for nowhere in the country, we see it most dramatically with the people in Idlib. But I think for everybody, there is the question, what is coming next? And therefore, I think it's really important to discuss this. I mean, we have certain tracks where international donors and international actors became involved. The humanitarian side is just one, um, one complex, one issue area. We have the political track where negotiations have been tried on different levels by the UN, but also by supporters of the regime like Iran, Russia, or then Turkey. Regional powers have set up their own framework, the Astana talks, but none of these formats so far is promising in terms of delivering really a solution that would allow people to really have their rights. And no solution is uh, to be seen where people really have a perspective for being able to live in Syria under their conditions because there is this one powerful actor, the regime, as long as it's clear 
there is nothing that curbs the regime's power over citizens and it is negotiating exactly knowing this. How are you going to find a solution that serves all Syrian citizens? And as long as we don't see that, I think our hands are bound in terms of a political future. We can't really solve that. And I think on the we might even discuss have this kind of negotiations the way they were led. Have they increased humanitarian suffering on the ground? But well, for that, for a solution, the, the prospects are really dire. So if we talk about things we can do, I think we will come to that in more detail later, but I'd say we should see how can we really improve the situations of civilians on the ground and we should find ways to support them, even though the UN might not be the mechanism that has been most promising and has been most helpful, we definitely have to explore how we can with and aside of the UN deliver aid. And how can we make sure we understand, like everybody in Europe, for example, understands people cannot be deported to Syria, people cannot return. It's not the war that has been driving people out. It is mainly the political constellation that leads to injustice, that leads to harassment, that leads to be people being killed because of their political views or because of who they are and from where they are. So if we can manage uh, to do something on these two areas, humanitarian aid and make sure people who we couldn't protect in Syria, we still protect them here, that would be two major achievements. Wow, uh, thanks. That's Great, that's the perfect introduction, I think, uh, for, for the next hour to, to discuss about. Uh, Farish, I mean, you get the, the on the ground information, you probably call um, your families or, or friends. Um, what is their perspective? I mean, I, I know that actually the Russians complain about that we do we don't do enough to reconstruct uh, Syria. So I think this couldn't be more cynical. While I haven't really figured out, and, and Benda has also uh, mentioned that, I mean, the war has not really stopped. Uh, the situation is, is terrible still, and people are in need. So what is, what is the civilian perspective on the ground? What, what kind of information do you get from, from your friends and families? Thank you for having me. I mean, the situation, first of all, uh, I would say the humanitarian situation in Syria today, in areas I'm talking about central cities such as Damascus and Aleppo is very terrible. Um, a civil servant, is taking a salary that is not enough for him and his family to live. A few days ago, an 80 years old man was beaten up in front of a bakery uh, and, the, and, and, the, and the bread was taken from him and he was bleeding and pictures were circulating over the net. Um, last month and the month before, two people in my village were killed, one because of $7 and the other because of humanitarian aid, they were distributed over a fight uh, over humanitarian aid they were distributing. So people are searching for bread. That's the main thing. When you talk about the other basic things, including electricity, for instance, electricity in a village like mine that lies just on the outskirts of Damascus, almost 20 kilometers from Damascus, the electricity comes almost four, two, to two, on, four, off. And that is not enough for, I mean, at least for your heating, it's not enough for having warm water, it's not enough for having, it's not enough for a shower, etc., etc. If you speak about, what shall I say? If you speak about fuel, for instance, um, winter is here, Children are freezing. The situation is really bad. The queues in front of uh, gas stations are high. The government keeps saying that, well, winter, it was a surprise to us this year. Well, winter is a surprise. Summer is a surprise. Spring is a surprise. Uh, my father himself is, a reti is retired. His salary is not enough, as I said, to buy one kilo of meat, if you want. A monthly salary. My brother works for the government as well. 
his salary, he is an engineer, his wife is an engineer, and both of their salaries is less, both of their salaries is less than a hundred a uh, hundred dollars. A family today needs at least six to five to six hundred dollars per month in order to meet the basic needs. So this sanctions were were really uh, the U.S. and the the European sanctions on, on on Syria are very harsh on civilians. However, when I look at um, at the other side, I would say. Uh, a few days ago, uh, Immatel Telecom Company, that is said to be owned by the first lady of Syria, has launched um, the new version of iPhone, which is, um, I think it's for 5 million Syrian pounds. I don't know how much is that in, in, um, in, in, in US dollars. But if you compare that to, I think, it, I think a Syrian civil servant needs almost 20 years to work for 20 years in order to get that that iphone so we if you are in the streets of damascus you see really very old uh, sham cars syrian made or iranian made cars that are too old but at the same time you see brand new uh, bmws and and uh, yeah the, the latest brands so we, we, we live in between two worlds. My family and, and the Syrian people are living between, between two worlds. One is dead and the other is unable to be born. Well, thank you. We will come back to this. Um, while I will ask Lino now about the to entangle a little bit or detangle a little bit uh, the interest of the international actors. Of course, we followed with big concern the interest of the Russians. Mm -hmm. They have backed uh, Assad and the Syrian regime from the very beginning. Uh, why? You might explain this to us, but this is not the only regime and these are not the only groups uh, who have uh, supported uh, Assad. Uh, on the other hand, I think we, at least in this uh, circle or in this group, were all pretty disappointed by the uh, reluctance of the US Americans, of Obama and his formerly known as red line, but never then um, realized this red line. And uh, so maybe you can explain a little bit why it could happen as it happened in Syria and why the absence of the international community actually brought us where we are now. I mean, this would be at least my interpretation, uh, not because of the big engagement of the international community, because of the absence. And um, yes, Lino, maybe you could uh, tell us a little bit more in detail. Mm -hmm. What's your take on this? Yeah, well, um, first, uh, thanks, uh, Viola, for having me. Um, it's an honor to be included in this panel. And um, I think we all know here uh, among us that, of course, um, you know, the Syrian uh, drama was something that started within. So, I mean, uh, maybe to the audience, it's interesting because, I mean, if we focus on the international community, I think this is a very very important thing, but one has to first stress that um, it was the internal um, demand of the Syrian people, uh, you know, calling for dignity and freedom after, um, yeah, the regime in Dara resorted to um, torture of children and 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 uh, yeah, and beating them up and not showing any 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 um, respect to their families and not 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 making any concessions that people. Yeah, demanded their rights, and of course, when you know this escalated, um, people looked towards the international community, and the international community was watching the whole thing. And I think um, a lot of people, uh, when they saw that um, they were not strong enough to actually uh, overcome the regime, because they were resorting to military violence uh, from the very beginning, they were hoping for a Western support at least diplomatically but you know when when things escalate even even militarily so i think the problem with the west was that um you know a lot of people thought um yeah we had made bad experiences in afghanistan and iraq so um let's better stay out of it 
at the same time paying lip service to um, yeah the struggle for human rights and democracy. So I think a lot of people, especially the U.S. administration with Obama, thought, okay, we can you know have a twofold strategy. On the one hand, saying yes, uh, we support the legitimate demands. Um, first just calling for Assad to reform. And after that didn't uh, turn out for him to resign, but at the same time, never committing. So uh, what Obama did was of course, uh, famously claiming in 2012 that, uh, you know, um, if the Syrian regime would uh, seriously uh, utilize chemical weapons, they would step in and would not let that happen. And only actually almost a year after he made the speech, um, the um, Syrian regime made the deadly uh, chemical attack against um, the Ruta, the area is east of um, Damascus, and um, yeah, many, many people were slaughtered to death, and there was no, as we know, there was no military intervention. So actually, I think the West has done uh, too little and too much at the same time. They sent signals that they would get involved, but when it, you know, came... Um, to a close or when it was uh, really a decisive moment, uh, they backed down and the Americans, yeah, thought it would be good for, uh, you know, regarding uh, international reputation and also domestic demands to stay out, to just stay clear of Syria. And I think the Europeans were just, you know, um, bystanders. I think um, European, especially the German public is always very good about, you know, discussing the US foreign policy, but, of course, we are lacking, um, yeah, political um, punch weight and also military capabilities. So, most of all, it's 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 a game of you know how to assess the U.S. strategy and maybe criticize it or maybe adjust it. But if the U.S. doesn't do something, then uh, in Germany, of course, nobody would would enter it. And um, yeah, I mean, it was there was a serious discussion in France to to actually. Um, intervene also militarily, but when the US decided not to, um, that also, of course, stalled because um, no, no European power could do it on its own. Talking about Russia, I think, yeah, Russia had an interest in the beginning to, to side with the regime. Um, that has mainly two reasons. One reason is, of course, that um, Russia always, well, they have a longstanding relation with the Syrian regime. Um, they, they have sold weapons um, and they have a small base since the 1960s already. And um, they also have the fear um, since dating back to um, the early 2000s that, yeah, the wave of democratic, democratic revolutions could not only um, yeah, endanger Russian, um, Russian interests abroad, but also one day be a risk to Russia itself. So Russia has actually an interest in uh, containing and uh, containing democratic aspirations and also um, cracking down on them. And the second reason, of course, is that yeah, Russia wanted to um, use the opportunity of the Western powers, obviously, uh, uh, making a basic uh, uh, factual withdrawal to to yeah um, step in in, in the uh, in, in their place and and show that they can yeah actually impose. Um, uh, a, a important role and that they actually have, um, that they are a power that has to be dealt with on the international stage. But it was a very, very uh, um, destructive role they played. And first, they only helped by military aid mostly they, and, and diplomatic aid. They um, yeah, played a very um, bad role with the UN Security Council, um, basically um, frustrating any, any attempts to have constructive um, UN resolutions. And then of course in 2015, after the West uh, decided not to do anything about the Assad regime and only, only I, I, I put that in uh, yeah, quotation marks, uh, dealing with ISIS militarily, uh, Russia decided to uh, enter full scale and, and, and started the military intervention and um, helped Assad to fight back um, uh, large parts of the countries. And without this uh, direct military intervention by the Russian Air Force, um, we would see a very different picture in Syria today, I'm sure. I mean, when, when uh, Russia decided to directly 
uh, get involved. Um, large parts of the country were not under control of the Assad regime. Um, Idlib was completely under control of the, uh, of the opposition. Aleppo was still partly controlled by the opposition and Assad regime, uh, the Assad regime was really threatened. So this indirect um, approach of the Russians didn't work and then they decided to, to go all in and um, they knew that the West would not be willing to, to stop them. So I'll leave it at that uh, for the moment. Maybe you could make a couple of remarks towards the, uh, uh, how would you see um, uh, the interference of Turkey? I mean, they came pretty late into the game, but nevertheless, they were blamed for at least uh, start to interfere while all the others, Iran, other militias and, and so on, they were taken for granted, I, I would put it. But, but, but when Turkey entered that, uh, that war, uh, there was at least in the West uh, quite an uh, uh, opposition and the resistance, which is of course right. But on the other hand, um, I, I saw that uh, it seems to be like a, a balance of power for, for quite a few months, but uh, there was not, I wouldn't call it a positive or constructive role, but how was it uh, perceived in the region? Also, the question would go then to to Mohammed and 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 to Bente. But uh, I mean, from the let's say regional um, perspective, uh, while of course I observed the uh, Nagorno Karabakh uh, in this hot conflict there, um, and you see that obviously soldiers and fighters from Idlib. Uh, were brought, uh, transferred uh, to Nagorny. And now, of course, this is uh, uh, at least an opportunity for Putin to see a weakened uh, uh, Idlib or weakened region where it might be easier for him mm -hmm. <clears throat> and Assad uh, to, to get it uh, completely um, cleaned. And so I'm not so sure what, what is the, the role of, of, of the Turkish government in that conflict or in the war. Yeah, well, I will try to um, give a, a short overview. I mean, I, th I think also this is a good question for Bente because she's written a whole book on the uh, foreign relations of the Assad regime. So she could maybe say more um, than me, but I will at least give a start. I think I wouldn't say that Turkey was late in the game, really. I mean, um, they, of course, they are a neighboring country and they have a long uh, border with uh, Syria and they have various also partly conflicting um, interests in Syria. I mean, um, at the outset of the revolution, Turkey had this kind of uh, thing that we call sunshine policy, where they try to have benevolent relations with all their neighbors. And, uh, you know, we also have these famous pictures of Bashar al-Assad and uh, Recep Tayyip Erdogan uh, being on holidays together. So, Russia was not, uh, Turkey was not, um, you know, um, Luke War uh, was not very hot about uh, supporting uh, the opposition in the very beginning, but when the conflict turned out so violent, uh, Turkey used this opportunity to picture itself as the uh, champion of the Sunni Muslim cause of um, yeah, supporting the legitimate demands of the Syrian people, but also uh, especially of the Sunni uh, majority of the country and um, yeah, use it or try to use it as an opportunity to um, yeah seriously engage and 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 get an influence in the north of Syria, but also I mean Russia uh, Turkey has a conflicting interest which is containing uh, Kurdish separatism and, and and that's why it had a very complicated relation with Syria in the past. Uh, the Syrian regime has at times supported uh, PKK fighters, while at the same time also uh, the Syrian regime has no interest in accepting um, uh, uh, Kurdish autonomy on the long run in its own country, but using it as a tool against Turkey. There were also conflicts uh, around water uh, resources and all this. So um, later when it was clear that um, the ISIS uh, was establishing itself in uh, to the east, uh, to the south of the Turkey border, and which was first, yeah, more or less accepted by Turkey uh, when it was thought, you know, useful in fighting fighting the Assad regime. 
and, uh, and Turkey found out that the only um, strong force present to fight uh, ISIS and, 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 and being an ally of the US were Kurdish forces. Um, I think the focus of the Turkish side shifted from fighting Assad and, and, and yeah, increasing their presence in northern Syria um, by, uh, to containing, containing the Kurdish um, autonomy project. And that's why uh, also, you know, a lot of these military interventions were actually, uh, what, which we have seen in the last years, were not focusing on damaging Assad mainly, but um, yeah, stopping, stopping any, any Kurdish projects of autonomy. With this regional thing, of course, they, 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 they play a long distance uh, uh, match, Putin and, and Erdogan, they have a strange relationship. They are allies sometimes, or at least cooperating partners because both have a strained relationship with the West. But also, I mean, Turkey likes this um, um, role of being the champion of the Muslim cause. So um, and now that the Idlib thing doesn't really go any further, they, they, they are not keen on fighting the Russians there. They use fighters in different war theaters in Libya and now in Nagorno-Karabakh to actually show Putin that they also have their outlets that can fight for them, just like Putin uses irregular fighters like the Wagner Group. And so, um, yeah, they use it in a kind of um, a fight for balance with the Kremlin. <laughs> And uh, you want to maybe uh, compliment, no, add a little bit more to this from your perspective? Yes, I definitely like to, even though uh, Lino covered already many of the aspects that are worth mentioning. Maybe going back to a very fundamental remark that I think holds true for any power directly involved in the conflict, none of them, not Russia, not Iran, not Turkey, none of the powers that are on the ground intervened ever in solidarity with the Syrian people. They all were pursuing and still are pursuing their own interests. And that, of course, is a really, really bitter situation for those who rose up uh, because they, the only support they ever got was because somebody found some interest in them. I think it must be the same as bitter for the regime and it could uh, turn out even worse for it. Because if we look into interests of foreign states and their involvement, they might also change. It's not a long-term commitment, I would say. Russia has no long-term love relationship with the regime. But if you look at it over the course of the past 30, 40 years, it's always good when serious relations with the West are bad. Then all of a sudden, uh, Russia comes in and pretends uh, that it is nice and has good relations and it does something. But while helping the regime, so to say, it is already writing the bill, saying, well, uh, once the relations of, with the West become better, this is what we will take out of it and we'll pressure the regime. They did so. Over all the 90s, uh, then in 2005, when the regime got under pressure because of their role in assassinating the former prime minister of Lebanon, Western sanctions enhanced on, and Western pressure on Syria, all of a, a sudden the Russians were back. So it's always really very, very strongly interest based. And the main interest in Syria is that Syria is instrumental. It can be turned against the West. It can be, um, it can be boosted once the relations of Syria with the West are bad, and then it can be used as a tool against the West. And we've seen this here in several regards. I mean, the refugee uh, issue has brought Western states under pressure, which is very welcome for Russia politically, of course, to live with this uh, tension that. There, there are Western states who express how committed they are to democracy, and then they cannot really do or do not really do anything to help their democratic um, admirers, their democratic partners. So in many regards, Syria has been a godsend for Russian foreign policy, and this is not because they have any interest. What, what's, what's, uh, just uh, sorry to interrupt you, what's the reason for standing aside? Is it the fear of the domestic audience? Is it the fear of, as Vino has said, we have to explain quite a lot why in case we would like to, <coughs> to be engaged in, in Syria, that would cause some casualties and we are not ready for this or what is the reason to stand aside or <coughs> we don't want to be part of this power struggle 
What, what well, I think your... in the beginning, it was not really a power struggle, but everybody was hesitant because people would compare things that could not be compared. They would take Iraq and Afghanistan, two countries in which the foreign intervention came without uh, without supporting a local uprising. This was a US decision to go into these countries to have an intervention and to do re regime change. And these wars, of course, were therefore very different from what was happening in Syria. Nonetheless, the comparisons abound. And the second thing that people would talk about when the Syrian revolution started was that the situation in Libya, where there was also an intervention supporting the people and uh, establishing a no-fly zone, that this was not really turning out the way they wanted. But they completely ignored what, I mean, if. Gaddafi would not have been ousted. Probably Libya would look as Syria does. I mean, casualties in Libya until today are so much less than in Syria. The situation is not good, obviously not. And it is constantly also deteriorating, but it is a completely different situation. But people would compare it and say, well, before we get involved in something like that, let's rather stand here and let's watch it. And we were talking so many to, to so many Syrian activists in 2011. We didn't hear a single time anybody wanted an intervention. People were so proud. They said, we're going to manage it. Look at us. We have the stamina to stand up to this regime. They had so much courage and so much creativity. But when they got aware of that intervention was happening, an intervention of Russia, on behalf of the regime, a diplomatic protection in the Security Council by Russia, they noticed that the, the conditions had changed, whereas the West, if you look at the many protesters here who always protest, protested against intervention, they protest, protested against US intervention in Syria and they let everybody else intervene. It was just more comfortable. And then of course, now, if you mentioned Turkey, the situation was, uh, complex before Turkey directly militarily intervened, but um, with Turkey now the situation has become completely uh, uh, Im impossible to handle, so to say. If we want to bring aid into Syria and don't want to go through Damascus, then the Turkish border is the one that we need, so we need Turkish cooperation. At the same time, of course, to watch how Turkey is, um, is uh, intervening against the Kurds how Turkey is also taking fighters out of it and sending them to other conflicts, it's unacceptable as well. So how do we handle this? So with every year of the conflict, it became more difficult for European countries, I'd say, to find a good way. And they always wanted it glass clear. They always wanted the very clean way. And if there was a tiny little doubt about whether they might be sending aid to the wrong people, understood always as Islamists, uh, they would rather not do anything than to risk getting criticized for it. So I think, yes, what you said, the image, their reputation, their home audience, it played a major role because there was just no courage to be as courageous as the Syrian people. Uh, that's, may I add a small yeah, comment? Yeah, please. Otherwise, yeah, oh, go, go ahead. Yeah, just, just to, to, to add uh, to what Bandit said, if we summarize it, we could say that the West actually stayed out because they feared things could get messy if they intervene and they don't know about the consequences, but we never debated about the consequence of not getting involved. And I think, uh, as Bandit just elaborated, the situation is messier than ever imagined. It could, it could have been by, you know, massive diplomatic uh, intervention or uh, intervention with a military component. So uh, yeah, we've never discussed about what the results of just staying out and uh, watching could be. Faresh, you want to comment on this as well, maybe? And then I would also uh, give you a question. I mean, uh, Bente has quickly uh, touch this different negotiation uh, teams and also Astana and, and different. So also from a Syrian perspective, I mean, what would be the critical, uh, credible players, uh, actors from Syria you would like to have as, let's say, committed the good guys who need to uh, who need to be in the negotiation team so there can be any kind of uh, sustainable peace in Syria they can Syria could at any time come back to a path of reconciliation 
I would be interested in, are there any or are they all already in exile and how within the Syrian community is this also being debated? First of all, I guess that the West has been intervening or the international community has been intervening in Syria or sometimes I would say over intervening in Syria. Uh, look at Iran how, and look at, at Russia, how they are supporting, uh, supporting Assad. Look at Hezbollah that has been recently classified by Germany as a terrorist organization. So uh, this is one side. On the other hand, we see lots of other players backing the opposition forces. So fueling the war in Syria has been done by the international community. We are fighting through, I mean, Syrians are fighting through or by means that were made by the international community, maybe except for the chemical weapons. We killed each other by homemade chemical weapons, so to say. What I want from the international community now to, is to, to support the Arab League in order to pressure Assad to leave. Uh, I want the international, I think that the solution is in Syria should come hopefully from, a, from the Syrians themselves. I don't see that coming at any time soon. Um, but I would like to see the, the international community pressuring the Arabs in order to pressure, put pressure on all the players in Syria to, to stop this war. Of course, I want to see Assad out, uh, but uh, Today, I think that there are some Arab countries that are um, in, in some way trying to re-engage Assad as they did after 2005. Uh, we are talking about the Omani, Oman sending an ambassador to Syria, UAE, Bahrain sending a, an ambassador to Syria two, two years ago. Uh, President Sisi of Egypt, he said a few years ago that he wanted to, sit, to, to send some, some weapons uh, to, to, to us in order to, to help Assad. However, the Arab League, uh, the head of the Arab League said recently that uh, re-engaging Assad or bringing Assad back to the Arab League is not on the table. Uh, Russia wants, wants to back Assad and, and, and Putin was in the beginning of 2020, he was in, in Damascus. We saw him, um, he is now pressuring in order to, to find some to hold some some uh, uh, conference uh, or regional or international conference in order to find a solutions for or to bring back Syrian refugees uh, into Syria, uh, and I don't know where they are, where he wants them to come back to to camps inside Syria or to we want to re uh, invent new way new methods of of killing those people. Uh, I think also that some the, the, the some Gulf states are trying to open some channels between Israel and Syria. Assad in some way, um, or they th thought in some way that Assad may accept that uh, he will be re-engaged internationally through uh, through Israel. However, again, he caught the road on on those countries or on on. I think the Umanis were, were doing that. And he said in an interview recently that he, uh, want, or he, he wants peace, but he doesn't want peace uh, without the Golan Heights back. Uh, he didn't touch upon, uh, uh, he didn't talk in that interview about the Palestinians. He didn't talk about the Arab initiative. He didn't talk about, uh, uh, or he didn't condemn the, the, Arab, uh, the, the Arab states or some Arab states uh, uh, new deals with, with Israel, new peace deals with Israel. Uh, and he wants an impossible, an, an impossible condition um, so far. I mean, today, I don't think Trump will ask Israel to withdraw for, from the Golan Heights. I don't see Israel withdrawing from the Golan Heights. I don't see Syria today capable of bringing back the Golan Heights. So uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, they are counting on, on the winning horse, so to say. So I guess that, that the international community first needs to pressure on the Arab states and, 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 and play or, or coordinate with Arab states in order to find a, solutions for, for a solution for what's going on, number one. Number two, uh, 
we need more pressure from, from the international community, community on Assad himself. I don't understand why we have a representative of Assad today in the UN. Uh, it's, it's not acceptable. I don't think it's wise and it's acceptable in the 21st century to see a representative of mass murder in, in the UN Security Council. Absolutely right. The slaughter uh, himself uh, should be at some point be um, excluded. There are two questions concerning you mentioning the Arab League. I would read them too. And then there are two longer questions. Maybe all of you could have a look in the um, uh, Q&A section, but I will read the Arab League. Solution sounds great in my opinion. This is from Yamina. Uh, do you think it uh, would still be workable even a lot of the resources and manpower uh, end up coming from Western actors, albeit uh, still under the leadership of the Arab League? And then the second part of this, actually, can we imagine Western slash European actors being willing to intervene under the leadership of the Arab League? Um, Faraj, would you would you comment on this? It's I mean, the thing is, uh, if I got the question correct, I don't I'm not saying that the Arab League will lead or not. It's not about the, the leadership. We have seen the international community intervening in, in uh, the first or, or in the Gulf War in 1990 against <laughs> against Saddam Hussein. Many Arab countries uh, were fighting on the side of the US and on the side of the international forces against the, the Iraqi aggression against, or the Iraqi occupation of Kuwait. Uh, and, and I guess that we, we can, today we can find something like that. Uh, I'm not talking about mili a military intervention. Uh, I'm talking about a political, diplomatic, uh, humanitarian pressure on, on, on that regime. So yes, I, I think it is possible if we want or if the international community wants to stop this massacre, uh, they can. Lino Bente, any one of you would like to pick up this and maybe one of the other questions? Yeah, I could maybe add two, two points to this. Uh, well, I think, um, you know, when we look at the US policy, I think, um, you know, some, some Syrians actually think uh, that, that, you know, Trump was more effective on curbing down on the Assad regime than Obama, who was, of course, very reluctant. Um, I, I don't agree with that assessment, but I think Trump has shown some, you know, um, some situations in, wi in which he was willing to actually, uh, yeah, give a show effect and, and clamp down on the Syrian regime when he thought it was, you know, um, good to actually show his strength uh, without actually ever, ever having having a good plan. So what, why I'm saying this is um, that uh, Trump actually did, um, you know, put, uh, put his influence on the Gulf countries to stop them from from fully normalizing ties with, with, with Syria. I mean, some, some of course went back to Damascus with the embassies, but I think we've seen some, some pressure uh, from, uh, you know, um, behind uh, closed doors from the US to stop, uh, yeah, normalizing ties with the Syrian regime. And if we had a consistent policy by the US and the West to actually say, okay, this is unacceptable, uh, we would not, uh, get uh, Syria or the Syrian regime out of the UN because, of course, that's not only a Western game and not only an Arab game, but at least we could stop um, uh, these efforts by the Syrian regime or, or frustrate them to normalize it. And um, yeah, the, the second aspect, of course, is when we talk about the humanitarian issue, um, we, we need to look closely at the role of um, the UN institutions. And um, as I said, for example, the World Food Program, I mean, Bentis Bell Foundation made a huge report on this, uh, has compromised itself in the past and, 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 and cooperated largely with the regime uh, and not doing enough to, to serve opposition held areas. So um, yeah, we need, we need uh, also um, a consistent effort to get more humanitarian aid into Syria but also with a critical view 
of the role of, of, of the international and, and, and UN agencies that, that work there and, and, and try to yeah, um, issue guidelines of how a uh, consistent humanitarian effort can be made, but without doing harm. I mean, following the do not harm principle. Yeah, that would be my comment. Well, I would like to comment on why we see uh, Gulf embassies reopening in Damascus and why there is not more U.S. pressure. And that is because of the U.S. being divided between a number of different interests. I mean, Trump's policy has not been the most strategic, but one of the core aspects in the Middle East is to counter Iran. So countering Iran means being softer on Gulf countries, having different relations with them, and rather uh, have them talk to Damascus than give Iran a bigger role. So I think it's not only coming out of this, but this explains why there has not been a stricter policy towards the Gulf countries. Their normalization deals with Israel were a priority, and then of course keeping Iran out and and whoever comes in, that's not that problematic for the US. But I would say altogether, the Arab League is quite a weak institution. I mean, it has never really been able to implement the things. Their, their initiative towards Syria was excellent, but we have not seen them implementing any initiative like this consistently. And therefore, I'm not sure whether we really win anything by trying to support them in this, especially if we already see the cracks in their in their like policy towards Syria. More interestingly, however, is how Syria sees the Arab League, maybe. Because like with the Arab League uh, conventions or summits, there has been a discussion also whether to re-invite Syria there, whether to re-invite the Syrian regime to be more precise and some states like Tunisia were very much in favor of it but the regime as we hear declined because they said first the Arab League should apologize and this is exactly the hybris of the the, the hubris of the regime they think they deserve everybody apologizing with them for their wrong policies they don't feel that if the Arab League or anybody else stretches out a hand towards them and makes a step towards them, they should maybe do the same. But on the on the contrary, every kind of offer, even though it might be very little as invitation of the Arab League to one summit, maybe this is met by an additional demand of the regime. This is why also negotiating with the regime doesn't lead anywhere because negotiation is compromise or should result in compromise. Whereas the regime with every kind of step in negotiations feels more empowered and more entitled to ask for even more without giving. So I think therefore I would be very critical when it comes to role of the Arab League. Um, I think that there are certain things, uh, a number of aspects that were mentioned here in the comments, if I read correctly, uh, there is the question, what is being done to support Syrians in the diaspora, in exile, in political ambitions and to like organize politically or in any other way? Of course, the ones for which uh, it is easiest to reach, um, to, to be reached are the ones that are in Europe for us in Lebanon, in Turkey, in Jordan, where most of them are, it is not really possible to do this because there they don't have a status as in Lebanon, they don't have a legal status, they are very vulnerable. And also for Turkey and Jordan, they try to keep them aside and to hope that it will go away. And they definitely would not want them, want refugees to become politically active. And this is why the, the groups that we can reach are really, really small. I mean, we as World Foundation, we work in civic education, we support political activism. We do it still inside Syria. We do it outside wherever we can, but really to, to work consistently and over a long term with groups, mainly we have groups that are either based here or they convene from different, um, different countries. They have members that might also still be based inside, but it's really, it was dangerous before, it was difficult before, and Corona now is putting an end to all this gathering, to all these gatherings that are not happening in one place. So we keep it up, but we're small uh, and conditions are really difficult for it. 
Uh, but I would like to also mention the legal processes that have started in a number of countries, in Sweden, in France, in Germany. These are driven by Syrian lawyers who are here and who are working with Syrians who are either also here or who they can engage with in other countries. They have been using the principle of universal jurisdiction. So if you experience uh, human rights violations in your country and they can't be tried there and there is no referral to an international court, certain countries offer the possibility to take your case there. And this is what Syrian citizens have been doing and quite successfully so, I would say. Of course, expectations have to be managed. It is, It will take a long, long time for these trials to come to a conclusion. And of course, they can touch only upon those who are here. And the main perpetrators, if we say the regime leading figures are responsible, we will not be able to put them on trial simply because they will not dare to come here. But at least symbolically and also for bringing Syrians together, for empowering them to do something that they were not able to do before, I think these trials should not, uh, not remain unmentioned here. Absolutely. No, I, I fully share this. And I think this <clears throat> was a question which I would like to forward also uh, to Farish, because I think this is also this first, uh, let's say, of jury, jurisdiction and also this feeling of justice and, and, and uh, what you have said about the Syrian lawyers uphold actually <laughs> the, the, the European or uh, the universal um, rule of law uh, principle. That's, that's very important and that's definitely something where you think that uh, the, the uh, identity of the diaspora people in exile, the opposition, could uh, uh, assemble. Um, before I read out uh, some more of the questions, uh, Faris, you want to uh, pick up and you want to comment how we see those trials uh, in the European Union or in the West in general? Just let me just make, make myself very clear. Uh, I think that just uh, after Bennett said um, uh, what her, her comment about the, the, uh, the Arab League, I, I do agree that the Arab League is too weak uh, and the Arab states are too uh, divided. I understand, uh, but what is the other solution? I mean, if, if I mean, who would lead uh, a, a, a kind of an initiative from all of this mess today in Syria, Russia, the US, France. I mean, we see France today, we, we, we have seen that the misunderstandings with, with the cartoons and, and, and how the comments of, of Macron has been read in, in, in the Arab world. Anyway, uh, I don't think that Assad in any way a legitimate nor legal president I think that he has been, we have seen him before 2011 as a uh, acting like a thug. We have seen him sending terrorists to Iraq. We have seen, we have seen him cooperating in the assassination of Rafi al-Hariri. We have seen, seen him burning European embassies in 2006. Uh, I'm talking about the, Euro, the, the Norwegian and the Danish uh, embassies in Damascus. Uh, after 2011, we have seen him or we have seen his Grand Mufti, the most senior official uh, among the Muslim community, uh, threatening Europe of sending terrorists uh, uh, to, to Europe. We have seen him also uh, very recently sending drugs uh, to, to, uh, to Europe. We have seen a lot of uh, shipments being caught uh, both in Europe and in, in, in the Arab world that were coming from Syria and, and, and Lebanon. Uh, anyway, uh, back to, to your questions. Um, I think that those uh, Syrians in, in refugee camps and it is even Syrians in, in Europe uh, uh, needs lots of, of, of support, needs lots of, uh, it's not only about, about not only which is needed so much food and, and, and shelter, but it's also mainly about education. I think that we should do a lot of, lot of energy and lots, lots of effort uh, should be made on, on, on children, education, and mainly on female uh, uh, children, because they are, uh, they, they, they will be building the future, I hope. I have, uh, I'm teaching at a school here in, in Sweden. I teach uh, st students who are above uh, 18 years old. 
most of my classes are, I have Swedes and I have non-Swedes, but I would say that 50% of most of my classes are Syrians. And I would say at least 40% of those Syrians and Syrian Palestinians are women, uh, single and, and mothers. Uh, they are trying to, 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 to build a better life. They are trying to go to university, get a building, uh, get trainings. I have uh, pharmacists, I have uh, chef cooks, and I have mechanics, and I have taxi drivers, and I have doctors, lawyers. Uh, I guess that the Syrian, the Syrian people are, are able to, to, come out, uh, to come out of all of this uh, 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 tragedy uh, very strong. Uh, but will they be? Will they come out united? This is a big question. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are a couple of more questions, and why Benda has already mainly uh, given answer to the two longer ones from Mark at the beginning. There's somebody referring to Kosovo. It's clear that we have the many states include. The conflict in Syria in 1999 in Kosovo was a little bit different, but the conflict was during three years and the coalition of states marked the humanitarian intervention, which was successful. My question is why it is not happening in the case of Syria, or we partly replied to it. Conflict is already 10 years, the number of victims is large, but the states are staying in silence. Maybe Russia, America, Turkey and other states have uh, the same benefits being in uh, territories of Syria uh, oil, or maybe it's the plan to share the Syria on parts as protectorate uh, of the state, which is actually inside of the conflict uh, Syria Assad. So keep this in mind, please. And then there was another one. Um, I don't know who might give an answer to this. Uh, should be actually rather me. What can the EU contribute? For the release of the detainees and a forcible disappeared and the last question here is my question is regarding uh, to position of Kurds in future Kurds in Syria are an integral part of the Syrian government or oh, question mark in my opinion I'm quite pessimistic about the regime and the situation in Syria honestly I don't see future at the moment but for the Kurds is here hope in terms of a new democratic country or government? Who would like to start with uh, Bente? Yes, please go ahead. Well, for the question that involved Kosovo and whether Syria, whether there is an interest to partition Syria and uh, get hold of the natural resources, I think that it should be really kept, be kept in mind that Syria's oil resources are not fantastic. On the contrary, Syria was about to become a net importer of oil. Syrian oil also was always difficult to handle because it is particularly heavy, so there were not many re refined who, that could handle it. So Syrian oil and gas are certainly not issues for which anybody would really interfere here. I mean, Russia, for example, if you compare it to Russia's resources, it might be very clear Russia will not intervene because of getting hold of this tiny addition to its own vast resources. But it doesn't mean that it will not lay its hands on licenses once it is there. So it takes it as a nice to have, but I really doubt that there is any natural resource for which Syria would be an object of speculation that would, um, I mean, for which it would be worth intervening in the first place. But then also you have to keep in mind how to exploit whatever is there, whatever was there in terms of infrastructure has largely been destroyed or affected by the war. Um, pipelines have been blown up by different actors. So I think also it will require a lot of investment before you can really start benefiting from it if it's possible at all. So no, I don't think that this kind of interest is there. I would rather go to interests that are above Syria and heads and that is really tragic and also that might lead to Syria being dropped I mean if you, if you see the the points for example Libya which is much more interesting in terms of resources I think there is a refocus both of Russia and Turkey there or also 
<clears throat> Nagorno-Karabakh you mentioned before, that might not be a resource thing, but something that is much closer to Russian interests because it affects their neighborhood. Ukraine is much closer to Russian interests because it affects uh, European-Russian uh, relations so much more. So this is what I would say to the Kosovo question. And then, of course, uh, the future of the Kurds and the positioning of the Kurds and what they are being pushed into. That I find really also a very interesting and very sad because it was said before, there was a part of the Kurdish political spectrum liked by Assad, that was the PKK, because he could instrumentalize them against uh, Turkey. That was done for a long time. And even after in 98, Turkey and Syria had the agreement that this will not happen any longer. It was never really ceased. Uh, the relations would remain. And for all the other political parties in, in the Kurdish areas, they were tolerated, but they were controlled. Uh, and they were, uh, the Muhabrat the was watching them. Kurds did not have the right to teach in their own language, speak their own language, and they were always in a really difficult position. Autonomy was not in the cards. It still is not in the cards. But of course, the Kurds did so much more in terms of building structures and, and institutions than others. Not the least, or probably mainly because also their areas were not that affected by the war. I mean, if you're constantly being bombarded, such as many other areas of Syria, how are you going to build structures? How are you going to think of political, like shadow cabinets, etc.? Many did so, but of course, in, in the Kurdish areas, conditions were just much better also for develop that, for developing that. So yes, we see a lot of this, but I wouldn't say it's very democratic. It is an illusion that these structures that have appeared are democratic structures. And of course, the lifeline was that the US would partner with them and that France would partner with them. The withdrawal of US support, I mean, the troops are still there. They have maybe changed in shape, et cetera. They are still there, however, so it has not been overrun by the regime or it has not been controlled by others. But the verbal withdrawal and saying, well, OK, they were our allies, but we're not responsible for them, that completely took the air out of their negotiation position. And this is why they are stuck. They have Turkey against them. The Kurds are also divided. There are um, Kur Kurdish groups in Iraq that are more in favor of Assad. There are Kurdish groups in Iraq that, are, that have better relations with Erdogan. So altogether, they have no single group in their neighborhood that really is in favor of Kurdish autonomy, no matter which shape. So I think they will suffer the most because nobody is going to support them in what they want. And of course, the regime also will ask them to pay for not having their unlimited support. The Kurds maneuvered, I think, really wisely to a large extent between not ruining relations either with the opposition or with the regime. They had a bad experience before with not being accepted by the opposition in Syria. So they tried to carefully stay clear of major conflict. But in the end, I don't think there is a future for them um, for Assad, it's really a very helpful thing what Turkey does, curbing the, 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 the Kurdish ambitions there. This is what Assad would like to do, and he doesn't have to do it on his own now. They are doing it for him. Is that shared by Farish and Lino as well? And maybe we have one more question, which I would read, and you could... Uh, uh, this is a little bit a different a different field. I don't think building a better life elsewhere is the solution. So the course of ref, uh, refuge, refuge should be eliminated in order to solve the problem. Well, that's a very common na uh, narrative. I think here should one distinguish between uh, the current regime and the institutions in place. I don't completely understand that, but this might be my lack of knowledge of the situation in Syria. But so who would like to um, try to reply to this? Well, First, Lino maybe, and then... Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe I could go ahead. Yeah, um, I mean, um, I think, of course, uh, you know, whenever um, there were scenarios put forward for a future in Syria, there were ideas of, you know, uh, including 
the lower elements of the steering state apparatus uh, in any future plan. So, I mean, of course, it makes sense to differentiate between those people who have blood on their hands and, and, and the normal uh, lower echelons of, um, of, of the apparatus. I mean, of course, it's, it's impossible, you know, uh, before 2011, before the uprising, it was impossible to actually, you know, um, ev avoid the regime. So a lot of people, you know, were not ideology, ideologically supporting the, the regime. And we have some state institutions, but of course, they are largely compromised um, by decades of dictatorship. So, um, I think we could not count. I mean, of course, now there's no clear pathway for Assad to go soon anyway. But even if he was to go, we, I, I, I wouldn't uh, be too overconfident that the um, institutions of the Syrian state are that stable because they have never um, been uh, allowed to operate under uh, normal conditions for decades. Um, I would like to add something to another question about what we could do about the um, forcefully disappeared. I think this is a very important question. Um, to be uh, honest, I think uh, we have not a very clear solution to this because, I mean, of course, if we would negotiate with the regime, there would be some, some you know, uh, tit for tat where we would have to offer the regime something. And I don't think it's good to enter into negotiations with the regime where we make too many concessions, but what we can do is to at least try to um, yeah, keep up um, the um, information about these uh, countless cases, about raising awareness of the public and at least not uh, engaging in a uh, you know, fruitless discussion about um, the war in Syria receding, Syria being more uh, uh, secure now so that actually we can send back um, um, uh, Syrian criminals or even regular refugees. I think uh, it's it's a ruthless regime, and uh, you know these uh, countless cases pay testimony to this. So um, yeah, we need to raise awareness, and um, of course, in any future solution, um, yeah, we have to find uh, find out about these cases. And um, sadly, I think most of these. Uh, um, forcefully disappeared people are um, dead by now. And then the other uh, issue about, uh, yeah, it would be better to uh, yeah, er erase the cause for, uh, um, for people fleeing. Of course, yeah, we all agree on this, um, but uh, as I said, there's no clear path right now to, um, to uh, getting rid of Assad, who is the main cause of suffering uh, in Syria and of people having to flee. So, um, and because there's no clear path right now, I think this is also a big uh, disadvantage of um, yeah, trying to yeah, help Syrians build uh, alternative democratic uh, structures. I mean, yeah, of course it's impossible in Syria now. It's, it's, it's almost impossible in the neighboring states, but even in Europe where it's safe, um, people uh, are uh, frustrated. A lot of people who thought, yeah, well, let's, let's get engaged, let's make plans. I mean, this, you know, um, non, uh, non um, activity of the West has frustrated so many people. So um, I think there's not, not a clear pathway now, but um, yeah, we keep, have to keep up the pressure on the regime um, and we have to make no concessions, not engage in any reconstruction that just funnels money into the hands of the regime thugs. And um, yeah, make sure that the regime is not gaining any 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 traction on the international arena. And then, on the long run, um, there will be a solution to 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 actually get Assad um, uh, out of of the power seat in Damascus. I'm sure. Farash, you have already uh, said a couple of words concerning the situation on Assad and what you what you think whether there is enough uh let's say pressure or no pressure on 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 the regime from the international community i would be also interested in how would you see this situation around the kurds what uh, bender has rightly explained and i think it's it's interesting uh and I would 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 like to hear your um, perspective on this as well if you don't mind i think the the kurdish cause is a national cause uh, I agree that they want the Kurds in Syria 
and in the region won't be given a state. I don't think anybody want, is willing to give, a, give, a, give them a state. But from the Syrian side, I think that the opposition, everyone, not only the opposition, should be working in order to give these Syrian Kurds their full rights as citizens, not as second degree or third degree citizens. Uh, I have lots of Kurdish friends who, who, whom I worked with. One of them was a doctor that was in almost 2000 and he, he was a real, he had, he had a degree in, in uh, medicine, but he, he was not allowed to work in the country and that's why he was working in, at a restaurant. That was an, just a small example. So I think it's, it's a national thing if you can't get uh, if you can't get a state for your own self, then you need to work on a national thing. Um, I just wanted to comment on something related to um, uh, that th there was something about about uh, migration that you mentioned, and there was another question about the Syrian the Syrian state and the Syrian regime. I think that the comment. The, this person, I guess, is 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 um, trying to negotiate between the the institutions in Syria, the ministries, the 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 um, the, administ the administration in Syria, and the political power, or the military and and security power. Uh, I do agree that there is a difference. Meaning, uh, we have a Syrian state, uh, we have ministries, we have a parliament. We have governors of every city. Uh, however, and we have a part, we have also very good people who are working in those places. They are not as qualified maybe as um, uh, administrative people in, in Germany, but still they are, the, the, the country is functioning in some way or at, it was functioning in some way until uh, some point. However, uh, the, the regime or the, the system in Syria is what I call the kleptocracy, meaning the, the country is, is occupied by a, a literally by, by a group of thugs uh, for almost uh, 50 years now. Uh, and unless we get rid of them, we won't be able to separate the state from the regime. Uh, we have a weak state, even before 2000, 2011, it was not that strong. Uh, it was so much corrupt, but we have we had at that time um, uh, no al no alternative. Today we have uh, uh, also we have seen uh, other alternatives for a state for a corrupt state, which is ISIS, for example. Do we want ISIS or do we want a corrupt state? It's I don't want either, but still I want a state. I want to work on on a state that is that. There are very good people inside of this state. I believe that there are very good people inside of the regime. They don't want Bashar al-Assad to be in power. I believe that there are very good people in the Syrian opposition. They are clean people. They don't want Assad to be in power. And we should, uh, I guess that we should, we, 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 we all should be working in uh, supporting all of them. And uh, may, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, okay, yeah, sorry. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. I wanted to add to two things. I mean, if we don't have those opposites, I think like ISIS was so corrupt. I mean, they were really squeezing the money out of the people they were living with and they were blackmailing them. So even if we thought there was any, any anything to that, that would look less bad about ISIS, even in this, they were completely a copy of the regime, I would say. But uh, I think this question of the um, of the detainees and the possibly disappeared really is very important. And therefore, I wanted to add one thing: the importance of taking this out of the negotiations. Lino, you already said it. We should not really give the regime too much for something that should be natural, so to say. Um, and I think really in in former years it was made a point that it should be a pre condition to release detainees and reveal the fate of those forcibly disappeared to bring them in touch with their families etc and then it disappeared last last time when uh, the UN special envoy was trying to address the public with what should be priorities for negotiations it was not there as something that should be separate. And I think it is very important because the regime will turn whatever it can get hold of into a nego negotiation um, tool or 
ship. And here, I mean, we've seen it with arrests in Syria that people get arrested, not only because of who they are and where they are from and what they have done, but because it is possible to make money out of it. It is possible to use them to pressure others and to, and to have uh, benefits. And therefore, if we have the issue of the disappeared as part of political negotiations, we might contribute to disappearances because it is an ongoing phenomenon. It's not, it never stopped. It is something that continues. And if we allow it to be part of negotiations, we would possibly create an incentive to cynically have even more disappeared. Okay, there are, yeah, you, you want to <clears throat> comment on it? I, I would also have another question because we have constantly people from IFD and other right-wing parties traveling to Assad and also then giving this regime a legitimacy, which I think is awful. And I am constantly thinking of how we can blame and shame and what kind of legal consequences could it have if, if somebody travels obviously to this <clears throat> country such as Syria where you have a, a dictator a slaughter a killing machine mainly and um, then I mean those people represent I don't know I don't know whether you have people from the Swedish parliament doing this but they are from the European parliament from the German parliament and how can we have stricter rules on this uh, so that we really condemn at least uh, this kind of travel in and legitimizing this? But you want to uh, maybe comment on what Bent has said before. Yeah? I, I just wanted to comment on the disappeared people. Uh, it's a very sad, it's a very sad issue that we, we, we need to raise the voice about. But also there is another type of disappeared people, those who are already dead. I mean, uh, I'm reading in the past few days about, not about, in the past few months about how Assad is or how Assad forces are removing uh, graves from one place to another. Uh, so this is just one comment or one, one, one news uh, thing that I have been reading frequently. I think the, 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 um, uh, the court uh, of Koblenz, in Germany is in some way contributing to that. The Syrian regime is so much, I guess they are so much afraid of it. They don't comment on that, but I'm, I'm very sure that they are uh, very uh, unhappy about it and they are trying to get rid of all the evidences. Uh, so even those who, who, who are already dead, they are in danger of um, uh, disappearance, I would say more disappearance unfortunately i'd like to add one thing also um, um you said like we need to shame these uh, uh travel um travel or, or journeys by afd and other right-wing populists who support the regime and who call for um yeah um deporting um criminals and others to syria i think yeah we, we definitely need to do so but of course, I think, um, yeah, it's, it's from a humanitarian perspective, it's not acceptable to, to um, deport any person to Syria, even if he's a terrorist and has killed people in Germany, because, uh, yeah, we, we give up our, um, our um, you know, principle of being a, a, a state under the rule of law, if we accept somebody to be um, yeah, put in a situation where there's no rights whatsoever, and, and, and his fate cannot be predicted at all. But, you know, to fight these narratives of the right wing uh, populists, I would also uh, add something because, of course, they would say, yeah, we don't care if, if some jihadi uh, gets uh, mistreated there. But I think it's also a wrong assumption that, you know, um, uh, cooperating with the regime, and that's what deportation means, cooperate with the regime, is a good way to actually uh, yeah, take a stand on jihadi terror because, you know, just like um, uh, Mohammed said before, um, the regime has sent jihadi fighters to Iraq when it was uh, seen fit uh, for the interests of the regime. So, I mean, if, if the regime would deem it, uh, um, you know, useful to send jihadis back to Germany, I mean, that they would do it. So, I mean, 
uh, cooperating with the regime and 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 deporting uh, um, criminals is not a way to uh, uh, make the world and Germany safer. In the long run, uh, you know that the regime is, is is more than willing to cooperate uh, with jihadi groups and sending sending terrorists to Europe. So. Um, yeah, it's it, it's not the bulk work against uh, uh, jihadism and 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 Sunni extremism uh, that it is portrayed by uh, by right wing populists and and by its own narrative that's uh, completely fake and we need to call that out. Viola, du hast dein Mikro nicht an. True. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, before I give all of you uh, the floor or the microphone for the concluding remarks, let me just read out the last comment and questions which uh, have arrived here uh, by Sana, which said uh, the most dangerous outcome uh, of what is happening is the loss of trust, uh, not only between the different actors, but also the components of the Syrian population. This is, my, in my opinion, is the blocking, finding any solution. How can uh, one uh, do, or what can, yeah, what can one do in this regard? And then a comment on what uh, Farish, I think, has uh, said. Is she said, exactly, it is for many a choice between a bad regime and the worst opposition, uh, ISIS, or in the best cases, the unknown. And we all know uh, how change is scary and difficult. Change management is not easy in general and in Syrian case, it is even more complicated. So with uh, further ado, I would like to ask all three of you uh, to make some concluding remarks. Um, I don't know who would like to start. Maybe Lino would be first then, and then Farash and then Bente at the end. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, just to uh, react to those last comment, I mean, of course, uh, restoring trust is is uh, key, and uh, yeah, the loss of trust is is a, is a huge problem. That's why you know we should have tried to stop the tragedy in Syria long ago, because of course the hatred between different parts of the population is enormous. Um, I think if we have some sort of um, you know, on the long run, um, transition away from the Assad regime into uh, at least, uh, yeah, the, uh, having a roadmap to democracy, we would need some sort of truth commission, maybe, uh, as we have seen in, in South Africa, so that people, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible to actually, uh, you know, uh, undo all the crimes, but at least uh, we need some perspective that people uh, can know what happened and 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 be informed about it and and be sure that the crimes have stopped. Right now, there's no way to uh, restore trust because, um, as Bente said, disappearances keep uh, uh, happening. Um, there's still fighting going on. Just today, uh, Idlib was attacked again. So um, I think restoring of trust uh, is you know would be good to have it now. But as long as we see no clear pathway away from violence and away from the Assad regime, uh, we cannot seriously work on rebuilding trust. So yeah, we, we need to focus on humanitarian work, uh, effective and not harming uh, humanitarian work uh, on the short run, and then finding a solution to put pressure on Assad uh, without him gaining traction again on the international community on the long run to have a transition. So that would be my final comment. Thank you. Farash, you want to, would you like to? Yeah. Uh, I think when it comes to trust, uh, I guess that one of the most amazing things that I saw here in, in Sweden and in general in Europe, uh, the issue about trust, <clears throat> you go for, uh, you, you see trust in every corner of this, of this society. Uh, you don't need a policeman to tell you what to do. You don't need a police traffic to tell you what, what to do. In, in Damascus itself, back in 2010, we had almost 8,000 uh, traffic police in, in one city. So uh, the issue of trust is, a very, is such a complicated thing. However, when we speak about Sweden, for instance, it's almost two years, uh, to, sorry, 200 years in peace. 
Uh, but in Syria, I mean, the last war we had, I mean, it's still 2006 was in Lebanon, but it's just still on the borders. And in, in practice, the country has been in war even before 2011. Uh, how to build trust? Well, we need to, or to rebuild the trust between Syrians. I guess that, first of all, um, trust does exist among lots of, lots of Syrians. Those who left Aleppo, for instance, those who left, uh, where, where did they go? Did all of them go to Europe? Did all of them go to, go to, to Turkey? No, not all of them did that. Most of them went, went to the coastal region. Most of them went to, to Homs and to Damascus and to Damascus countryside. Syrians were helping Syrians. Uh, uh, they showed really an, an, an encouraging hint about, about trusting each other. I guess, uh, but, but when it comes to, to uh, consolidating trust, uh, I think that we need to see justice. And justice by that, I mean, first of all, to get rid of Assad. This person should disappear in some way. Go to Russia, go, go to Iran, go to the Northern Pole, wherever you want to go. Uh, the other thing is, <laughs> the other thing is, uh, I guess that we should, I mean, the moment we, we get rid of him and we, at least we hold them, or, or at least we, we get rid of him uh, or hold them accountable for, for what he has been doing, uh, he and his gang. Uh, I guess that we, with just, with the economy starting to, to move on, I guess that people will, um, I'm not saying they will forget, but they will at least find, uh, find hope in life. And with hope, I guess, when you see hope in life, your perspective changes. Uh, so even during the war, as I said, I, I saw people, I saw Syrians trusting each other, cooperating with each other. Although of all of that we, well, hatred we see on social media, still the real people who doesn't have any capability or any access to social media, they are even more uh, than those who are behind the screens. So I'm, I, I would like, I'm not, I'm not optimistic, but uh, I'm not pessimistic either. Uh, I learned from, from, from this experience uh, in the war that the street always surprises us. Uh, I see it in my family. Uh, I see it in my friends. I see it in old friends who cut ties with me and then came back to see that, well, I'm not against Assad because he is from that sect or this sect or because he's from that political party or this or this political party. I'm against him just because he's, he's a thug. That's very simple. Syria deserves a better, a better future and a better person. Thank you so much. Bente, you have the last word. Well, there is uh, this question, uh, I think, uh, uh, the, whoever posted repeated it somehow or, or enhanced uh, it, what would be the alternative? And here I can just say, we, I mean, this also is an issue of trust. Now, for 10 years, we've seen the regime making promises, uh, making deals uh, on the tiny level, on the big level. We studied so many of them. We could not find a single, single tiny little deal in which the regime really complied with what it had agreed to. And this is a problem. So whatever we negotiate, we know it's not worth the paper that it's written on. And this is also the experience citizens have. You cannot trust this regime. Today, you might be among those who are tolerated. Tomorrow, it might change. And this is a big problem. Problem. And I think that we are really wondering what comes after it. I mean, the opposition was very colorful or very diverse from the beginning. And then came ISIS. And I don't see ISIS as opposition. They were too much alike and they were too much symbiotic. But there were so many people who we lost because we did not have the trust to really say, fine, we see you are there and we support you. So many lives and personalities. I think everybody from my Syrian friends can name so many people who were really icons of the revolution, who in their village or their part of town took responsibility among the very mundane issues of daily life issues. So we saw, I think in Syria, more than in any other country that I've been watching, people who are creative in their resistance and people who are willing to take responsibilities that 
are willing to do administration. They are not just revolutionaries who want to topple. They are builders of very boring things, so to say. And I think this, for me, is the, the, the main reason why I really, really believe there is a better future possible for Syria. And I agree, it might be so difficult to see after all these losses and after people turning their back to politics because they don't trust in this any longer and they don't see a future. Yes, it is terrible and we allowed it to happen but it doesn't mean people are not there any longer there are so many people who we see and hear and read journalists activists and very well, a lot of people who take responsibilities in their communities and i think if they don't stop believing in themselves we are the least uh, uh, entitled to drop them we should stay with them we should uh, support them we should see they are there and not look just at the big picture and say, well, this war has somehow been decided and somehow we can't do anything. Yes, we can. We can always do something as long as we have this potential that we have in the Syrian population among civilians. I think it's not lost. That's that was perfect for the last words. While we were speaking a lot about the devastating situation during the war, the casualties, um, the disappeared person, uh, torture, and so on, and somebody has also uh, posted in the in the chat or in the Q and A that 2.5 million kids do not go to school uh, uh, currently. So the, the development is, is not really showing us a bright future, but I think Banta, Lino and Farage have shown that there is hope and there are people, there are people who are doable, who, are, who can manage things, who can develop things, who are constructive and who are willing to contribute to rebuild this country in a, in a proper way, which people have deserved. And we all would like to contribute to those active ones, to those progressive ones, democratic ones, the new ones, the next generation. And I think this gives at least me some hope and hopefully also all the others who have listened uh, to this great debate tonight and who have actively contributed in terms of questions, remarks, comments, and so on. And uh, please stay tuned. We will of course, uh, um, spread this uh, video. But if you have any, any other questions, I mean, you have heard there are three excellent speakers, three excellent um, experts, and um, don't hesitate uh, to ask them bilaterally. You will find them easily. Thanks a lot for tonight and hope we will hear and see you once again. That was at least a very enlightening uh, debate on, on Syria tonight. Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.